All right, so it's 7 p.m. So I'm going to get started here. Thank you for taking the time today for attending my session about interview preparation tips. Perfect. So before we get started, I'm just going to let you know some pre seminar information. So as previously mentioned, this is being recorded and throughout the presentation, I will be providing helpful info as well as advertising some some packages I have on my profile at the end of the presentation. So after this, feel free to reach out to me at acceptedtogether.com and we can discuss anything you have on your mind in the messaging area on the website, as well as at the end of this presentation, hopefully we have some time for you to ask some questions as well. So just please keep those in mind until the very end. So to begin, my name is Nicole and I'm from Toronto. I completed my undergraduate degree at the University of Guelph. I did a Bachelor of Science in Animal Biology. The total duration of my program was four and a half years as I took an extra semester to try and boost some of my marks when applying to OBC. Currently, I am a phase two or second year OBC student, and I was accepted on my third application. I experienced two interview cycles, both of which were during the COVID years. So both of them included a CASPER test as well as a virtual personal interview. Outside of school, I enjoy attending live music events as well as playing basketball with my friends. This year I joined an intramural team with some of my classmates and it was very humbling that uh, my skills were a little rusty. Um, as you can see here on this slide, this is a photo of me outside OVC, as well as a picture of my pets, Phineas and Ferb. Okay, so where to begin? If you are applying to OVC, you would have already, um, and just to be clear, OVC is the Ontario Veterinary College in Guelph. It is the vet school I go to. Um, there are other ones in Canada. However, for my experience, as I solely applied here, my presentation today will be catered towards OVC. Um, but a lot of the information can be applied to other schools as well. So where to begin? At this point, if you applied this year, one, congratulations, it's a big feat. Um, just applying alone, as you know, it's a very intensive process. You have probably already submitted your background information form, kind of like your resume as an applicant, as well as completed the CASPER test, which is a written ethical test, kind of a typed version of the MMI. Um, so now what's next? You have all that behind you. Now it's kind of a waiting game to hear if you get an interview. And before you even hear back, you might wanna get started on interview preparation. That's something I did. So again, it's another obstacle before getting accepted. Um, how, where do you begin? It is quite daunting. So I, today I'm going to discuss kind of a multi-perspective approach to cover all your bases and boost your confidence. So to begin, I'm going to talk about brainstorming concepts and ideas as a candidate and as a student and slowly integrating practice sessions into that process and then more specifically practicing those mock interviews after building those skills and those ideas for yourself. So before talking about what and how to practice at all, something I really wanna highlight is mindset and balance throughout this process. It is draining, you're probably in school, plus or minus part-time jobs or just working solely on its own with the interview practice on top. It's a lot and it's something that weighed heavily on my mind when I was trying to get into vet school. So what really helped me was maintaining a positive attitude and starting preparation early. This allowed me to kind of stay optimistic, but real realistic with myself of where I could improve. As, as I said, it is stressful, but being able to kind of look at your BIF, background information form, see how much have I accomplished and, um, how hard have I worked to get here? Being able to recognize that will kind of be motivation within itself to keep putting your best foot forward. 
Um, so what I did is I started early and kind of had some practice sessions and brainstorm sessions here and there while reviewing my application, which I'll talk more in depth about shortly. But in between all that, be sure to take breaks because this helps with your productivity and learning and really absorbing those skills you're working towards over time. So as I said, a good place to start is looking at that BIF you submitted. If you had it edited many times and read it over and again before submitting, I'm sure you know it pretty well. I know I did, but I actually took the time to print it out and kind of made a chart. And I highlighted on the application itself and in a chart extrapolating on those ideas of what qualities can I identify from XYZ experience or this part I mentioned in my personal statement. How can I expand on this? What did I need? I mean, like, what did I mean when I wrote that? What was the motivation for me keeping it in my application? So kind of being able to defend what you wrote and expand on it will help you have a good starting point at how will I be able to speak in the interview and what do I truly believe? Because it's really easy to approach the interview answering questions how you think the assessors want you to, but I think it's really important to decide in advance and at the beginning, make a foundation of what do I believe, what do I, where do I stand based on all the experiences I've gained and how do I want to convey myself in the interview. So other ways you can do that is highlighting positive and negative experiences from each part on the BIF as well as seeing how can each of these experiences help me in my future career. And that goes for the positive and the negative aspects because veterinary medicine or even just medicine in general, it can be very challenging. So being able to see how you can be resilient and learn from setbacks in turn is a positive to further improving yourself as a professional and just as a person in everyday life. Um, and learning to identify specific examples you might want to draw from these experiences is very important. Um, not only what the experience is, but also how concise can I make it? How can I convey what the experience or the example or situation was without having it be a distracting bulk of my answer with a lot of details that maybe could be left out? Another thing you can do on the Accepted Together website, there's a list of free behavioral questions you can access. You can see in the photo below on the slide here, there's a few examples. Tell us about a time when you cheated, lied, broke the law, made a hard decision, helped an animal in need, etc. And you may have encountered some of these ideas when preparing for Casper. Um, and what I think is great about going over behavioral questions is it allows you to be reflective on specific experiences you've had. It again helps you practice how to be concise when recalling or reiterating these experiences and focus a lot on the why. So for instance, why did you have to make a hard decision? Why did you make the decisions that you did? It allows you to kind of analyze your behavior and your personality traits. And in turn, when going through these debatably difficult questions, it allows you to develop skills that if you were to receive a question you hadn't heard before in the real interview, you kind of have an approach or a mindset that allows you to answer genuinely and have a quality answer, even if it is a bit of a curveball because you haven't heard it before. So just being able to reflect on yourself and your experiences and concisely do so even if you get a behavioral question or any question at all that you haven't seen before, it will be a lot easier to do so with more questions that you practice. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> um, okay, so other brainstorm ideas for big concepts. Um, I kind of like to make a web and not only in relation to my application, but also as myself as a person, who were some of my mentors that got me to where I am today? Maybe they were some of your references. They could even just be friends or family. How have people changed you and what are values that align with yourself? Why do you want to be a veterinarian? 
it sounds like a really easy question. Like you love animals or you're really passionate about the profession, but being able to kind of find and build your story will help you stand out and again, build your confidence of where you stand as a candidate and how you want to convey yourself throughout the process. Um, and you can just see other concepts I've written on the slide here include what area of vet med interests me, what are some other areas you might want to explore, don't be afraid to do some research and, and see what your future can hold, um, what makes me a good candidate, why did I apply to the schools um, that I chose, why do they interest me, and future goals in and outside of OBC, because although, or vet school in general, because as candidates and aspiring veterinary students, a lot of the time we put a lot of energy into vet school itself. But even as a veterinarian to be sustainable throughout your career and as a veterinary student, it's important to balance what are goals for myself academically, but also from a work-life balance perspective or, um, for example, for me, like a basketball perspective, um, it's just showing that you're well-rounded. And although vet school or medicine is really important to all of us, which is why we're here today, um, it's important to recognize there's, that there's a lot of other important things that um, are equal outside of that as well. So checkpoint here, based on what we talked about so far, we've reviewed our BIF, we've discussed who we are as candidates and kind of looked into ourselves to see where we stand on these different brainstorm ideas. Now that we have a foundation of who we are, we need to see what is important throughout our profession, what we need to uphold. So something I like to do was familiarize myself and obviously now <laughs> uh, with the veterinary oath. So I'll just read it quickly. I will strive to promote animal health and welfare, prevent and relieve animal suffering, protect the health of the public and the environment, and advance comparative medical knowledge. So being able to familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with this, not saying you need to like quote it in your interview or anything like that. Um, what's important about this is you need to hold this to yourself throughout your career and even as a veterinary student. So kind of ingraining these values in yourself and see how they match with those other ideas you've already decided for you will allow you to make these connections um, to again, just like make yourself stand out as a candidate compared to other people. Try to stray away from textbook answers that you think want to be heard by the assessors, but truly just convey what makes you deserving of a spot in vet school and what will make you a good vet. So just familiarizing yourself with these different viewpoints of the profession and yourself, you can combine those ideas to be as genuine as possible in your interview. Along with that, our CVMA position statement. So CVMA is a Canadian Veterinary Medical Association. And if you go on their website at the link below on this slide here, you can see a variety of position statements that the profession holds um, towards controversial topics. So these could include, you can take a look for yourself and we'll look at one specific one together, but some can include like declawing of cats, um, tail docking, different um, approaches to euthanasia and such, um, and et cetera. So being able to kind of familiarize yourself again, not only with the oath, what do we need to, what kind of veterinarians do we need to be and people do we need to be to best represent the profession, but also what are specific controversies that we need to be aware of that we might deal with once in a while in practice. And again, what are those values we need to consider and biases we need to address within ourselves to ensure we're still putting the patient and the clients first. Um, and when I say the clients, I mean educating the clients in order to ensure the best interest of the patient. So um, when doing this, I went through the position statements on the website and I looked at the pros and cons or both sides of certain issues and decided where I stood and how can we address these issues from a bottom up approach on a big societal scale to try and make animal welfare and pet ownership more positive overall. So for example, one I wanted to include today was commercial dog 
and cat breeding. I thought this was really applicable because given the past few years in the pandemic, there's been a large spike in animal adoption, specifically with puppies and dogs. So here the position is CVMA opposes commercial dog and cat breeding operations that subject animals to suffering caused by conditions such as overcrowding, inadequate shelter, sanitization, food, water, and veterinary care, long-term confinement, and lack of social or behavioral enrichment. CVMA encourages potential owners to consult, um, basically just to summarize, informed dog purchasing as well as supporting um, responsible breeding operations. Um, so again, just encouraging research and education within people to provide the best ownership possible for the pet and again, like long welfare. So this is something I would have looked at and just wrote what I thought or maybe a specific experience that I thought of when reading about this statement. And just again, critically thinking in multiple perspectives about the profession as well as um, previous experiences I can draw to that. Um, Diana, I see your question. I'm just gonna address it at the end. Okay. Um, something else I did before I, I was working at the time while preparing for my interview. So while I was eating breakfast and getting ready for work, I would throw on CP24 and listen to professionals speak to the public. Um, I'd like to listen to how they would speak and were there any biases or certain vocabulary they choose to include? And what is my stance on the topic? So again, just practicing this critical thinking and self-reflection. So even outside of designated interview practice, I was getting the gears turning and listening to how professionals carry themselves to subconsciously help me throughout my preparation. Um, and again, if you were to get a controversial question or something that kind of threw you off, you're now practicing addressing those biases within yourself and taking a neutral approach. And this is a skill that's going to be required as a veterinarian because there's a lot of ethical dilemmas um, as a veterinary professional, and I'm sure you encountered difficult situations throughout your Casper prep as well, so it may be familiar to you, but again, just keeping those skills continuously working. So I'll check on the time. Oh, we got lots of time. <laughs> All right. So practicing interview responses. Um, what I did was a variety of things. Um, first off, I just want to compare my first interview cycle to my second one. Um, the first time what I did was I got some feedback from consultants on Future Me MD, which was the previous name of Accepted Together. And I only worked with one to two consultants and that was great. They were amazing, gave me great feedback. And I did that alongside help from my family and friends. However, um, what I changed in my second interview process was I got more, uh, a greater variety of consultants to work with. Um, basically, I allowed myself to have more sessions with different consultants so that I got different feedback and new faces to work with on the computer screen. And this helped me overcome more nerves as well as kind of reduce the bias with the consultant because over time they saw how hard I was working and how much I wanted this. And although they still provided me with the best feedback and sessions I could have asked for, having a variety of feedback allowed me to ensure I was just getting more information and resources at hand as well as I wasn't always comfortable with that familiar face on the other side of the screen, because when you do the real interview, it's gonna be a face you haven't seen before on top of the nerves of the interview. So I just preferred in the second cycle, um, changing that aspect. Um, along with that, I had some mentors and other veterinary students, again, just as many perspectives as possible on top of the foundation of values I wanted to hold, because when sometimes when you get a lot of feedback and I found this with, at, people editing my BIF as well, there's sometimes some feedback now contradicts itself. And I would stop and go, well, what do I say? Do I do say this? Or do I include this in my application? So at the end of the day, it's your application. 
and it's your interview and you know who you are and you can make the best decision of how you want to portray yourself in throughout this whole process. Um, something a lot of people did was record themselves during interview practice. Honestly, this wasn't super successful for me because I often got very distracted by myself on the screen or something I said, but I know it has worked really well for others. After uh, getting more comfortable with sessions and answering some questions and those foundational ideas, I started to implement a timer. And I recommend doing this sooner than later because the sooner you feel the time crunch or a little bit more of that pressure, the faster you'll be able to overcome those feelings. And the whole point of interview practice is not only to know what you want to say and who you want to be um, based on your experiences, but also really feel co more comfortable with those uncomfortable feelings, because I'm not going to sit here and say I wasn't nervous on the day of my interview, but because of all the practice I put in, I was then confident that I have done this before. I know what the time crunch feels like, and it just in a way felt like another practice session, which definitely wasn't the case, <laughs> but I, it helped me in that mindset kind of focus my energy into what I was saying and not how I was feeling. Um, and I find when practicing interview responses at first, I liked getting feedback immediately after answers because it would help break any bad habits with my mannerisms or things that I had said. Um, and then the more confident and comfortable I was getting, I would maybe do four questions in a row to kind of get used to the groove of questions back to back. And what is important about that is, um, let's say question two, you don't answer it to your standard or what you know, like the quality you could answer it to. Um, if you're able to bounce back and answer question three, despite those unsatisfied feelings from the previous answer, that's something you realistically may have to do in the interview. You're human and everyone's a little bit nervous. You might have a question that you wish you said differently or added something to, but being able to focus and regroup and ensure you answer the next question in the best way possible, that is more important because if you let one question ruin the rest of them, then your whole interview quality is going to go down. Um, and over time, I found that I was able to criticize myself after answers of where I could improve. And that's really key because then you're able to recognize and self-reflect where I could have improved and being able to recognize within yourself and not relying on solely consultants for, or even friends and family for this feedback shows that you're really developing the skills of like the independence of who you wanna be as a candidate. Um, and when cons considering a question before answering it, um, sometimes you can really integrate more qualities, examples, and fortify your answer by not only addressing the question at hand, because of course that's always a priority, but you can also further sell yourself and um, extrapolate further. And let me give an example. Um, if someone asked you um, what you learned at a particular in a particular class, you can explain what you learned and what your favorite lecture was, but being able to say this class will help me throughout my veterinary education or as a future veterinarian um, because whatever the reason is, you're now not only answering the question of what you learned or what your favorite class was, but it's showing you how it's going to better you in the future. So being able to kind of build on these things and build on your answers will be another way you can stand out against other candidates. So expanding on that, how do you respond to an interview question? So again, this is kind of similar to the STAR method that is very familiar with gener general interviews, even if, even if, oh my goodness, sorry. <laughs> even if there, it's just like a general job interview, a lot of people recommend the STAR structure. And this is kind of similar. So what I like to do is I would repeat the question or just reiterate it to show my interpretation of it and 
that I understood it. And it then makes you and the interviewer on the same page. It shows that, or maybe not, let's say you misinterpreted it a little bit, at least when you're answering it, now they know where you're coming from and they have the context of where your mind is at. So that's what I would do. I would repeat the question and outline the structure. So for example, if a question was, um, what is your favorite ice cream flavor? I would say, when considering my favorite ice cream flavor, I'm gonna talk about um, my favorite ice cream shop. And then it further explain wh which flavors are my favorite. So off the back, I'm outlining the structure and what I'm gonna talk about. You know, one, I'm gonna talk about where I like to buy my ice cream and which flavors I'm gonna go for. Um, and then I can give a specific example that maybe when I was a child, one day I went to Baskin Robbins and I had a sample of cotton candy ice cream. And from that day forward, it was my favorite ice cream flavor. Um, and if you had more ideas in your response, then you can transition to those topics you outlined if my ice cream question was more um, detailed. Um, and then to, I would put a summary at the end and finish with thank you, because when I say thank you and follow by silence or a nice warm smile at the camera, this will allow the interviewer to know, okay, the, this interviewee has finished their response and it's not this awkward limbo of, are they gonna add anything or are they still thinking? Just having this structure provides, makes the interviewer feel settled and it conveys your confidence through the screen as well. And again, this is just a general structure that I used and recommended. It is different for everyone. Again, focus on being concise. If I wanted to describe my example here with going to ice cream store as a kid, I would be really specific and leave out any fluffy details that would maybe eat up time at my answer and instead focus on the learning aspect, how it can help you in your future career and the whole why of it. And let's say halfway through your answer, you kind of lose your train of thought or feel overwhelmed. You could simply stop and say, before I continue my answer, I just want to gather my thoughts. And you can take a moment and look down at your keyboard and reorganize yourself. Because these few seconds, even 10 seconds to regroup will allow you to ensure the quality of the remainder of your answer. Because sometimes when we get in that overwhelmed state and kind of go down this rabbit hole of trying to fix the answer, um, it can do more detriment than good. So being able to take a moment and pause is very professional. And I think the interviewers understand that it's a stressful situation and would almost respect, or I think they would respect the fact that you would gather your thoughts and ensure you're optimizing your answer. All right, so practice environment. When I practiced for my interview, I practiced in the corner that I was going to do the real thing. I had the same background and setup the whole time. And you can see in this photo here, it's a pretty fancy setup if I do say so myself. I think my laptop was propped on multiple textbooks and had like a lamp hiding behind the screen, but whatever works, the point is for me, my goal and what I read online um, was I wanted to match recommendations online, which was to elevate my laptop so that I was looking up at the camera. So ideally it would be a little bit higher than what we're looking at with me today. Um, and a, a very bright light behind it to ensure my face was illuminated really well. And this is because not only are you making sure that you look great, subconsciously, I think it makes a positive first impression on the interviewer to have this professional first view of yourself as the candidate and you want to get as many points as you can on this interviewer's side and really show your best self. So I think familiarizing yourself with where you're going to do the interview with the professional background and as well as a predetermined outfit that you're comfortable wearing that also looks good on camera, this will help you reduce stress on the day of your interview and again, along with all the great things and all the great answers you're going to have, you're going to look and feel the part. And you really want to do that for yourself because you've worked a long, worked a lot and a long time to get here. Um, so you want to just show your best self again uh, when you do have the opportunity to do so. Now, approaching the interview day, very much a countdown and can be stressful as fewer weeks are between you and that interview. Um, 
this may not be necessary for everyone, but for me, I really needed almost a minute or hour by hour schedule for that interview day. I did not want any surprises or anything to ensure that I was in the best mindset possible. So I knew what I was going to eat for breakfast. I knew what I was going to wear. Um, I knew when I was going to go on a walk and everything like that. And I think I took the day or two before off work to ensure I can just completely relax. I, I don't think I did a lot of practice before my interview. I think I just reviewed like my main brainstorm ideas and um, that we discussed at the beginning. And I think I also did used a typing website to, oh no, that was for Casper, my mistake, getting a little confused here. Uh, um, pretty sure I had a minute by minute schedule before my Casper one as well. That's why I'm getting a little mixed up. But yeah, I took time to relax and did a light read of my notes. I think I did one mock interview where I had a consultant to go over like half an hour worth of questions in a row, followed by feedback, just to really make it feel real. So that the interview day itself, again, just in a way felt like another practice session, which sounds a little crazy. Um, but again, it allowed me to be self-aware with my feelings. I didn't cram a bunch of studying before it because I started early and really built that confidence. And it allowed me to sit there and say, well, I'm really nervous, but I'm also kind of excited for this interview. And I'm feeling so much more confident than last year. And being able to really digest those allowed me to be really calm, cool, and collected while I was waiting for my interview to start. And I think as I said at the beginning of the session, mindset is so important um, to because you can have all the ideas and have the best application, but if you're not able to really prove that you're ready in that interview, um, all of that unfortunately may not be able to hold up. And that's something I experienced. I went through a rejection and was it easy? Absolutely not. And I'm sure, um, you all can agree whether or not you have gone through a rejection before, but I'm here to show you that sometimes another year of preparation and self-reflection and more experiences can do a lot of good. And I remember I felt much more positive and confident and calm before my last interview compared to the one um, a year before. So again, you just have to trust the process. And again, just highlighting here that mindset is huge. All right, so that's pretty much all of the feedback and advice I have for you today. And I'm happy to answer questions after I finish um, this final spiel. But on my profile, you'll see a handful of packages I offer. So just a couple of bundles that may be catered to you to give you some structure throughout your process. So first and foremost, application editing and review. This is kind of not applicable if you've applied to OVC. I'm not really sure of the timeline for different vet schools, but I'm always happy to read over BIFs and review and edit that with you. So, and if you see here at the bottom, you'll be saving 20 to $30, depending on the package. My hour hourly rate is $45, but here you'll be saving some if you buy multiple sessions at once. So as I said, application editing and review, and then Casper test and interview preparation, kind of a mix and match there. Um, mock interview preparation. So it can just be general interview session practice, or just a full like if we have an hour session, we can do half where we do the mock interview and then the remainder of the time with feedback, kind of like I said, uh, something that I did leading up to the interview date itself. And something else I offer is mix and match where you can just buy four hours of sessions and you can cater it to what you think you need. And let's say you're not sure you know what you need. Feel free to shoot me a message. I've been in your shoes. It can be really overwhelming and scary and you want to put your money where it's worth it. So if you really want to optimize that with me, I am so happy to work with you and make this the best experience possible. Because yes, it is scary. And yes, it is a lot. And there's a lot of pressure. But at the same time, it's a great learning experience. And I've been through it for a handful of years. So um, I would love to be uh, someone that can support you not only with the content, but also I am, I like to be a self proclaimed cheerleader on the sidelines. So uh, feel free to reach out to me for anything at all. 
Okay, um, so feel free to send your questions in the chat. It looks like we have quite a bit of time. So um, a good maybe half an hour, 20 minutes where we can go over questions. Here's a QR code for my profile. And of course, Phineas and Ferb saying thank you for coming today because on top of application, interview prep, potential jobs and schooling, taking an hour of your time to do this today, you should commend yourself for. Um, oops, let's see, let me go back here. Okay, so I see Diana earlier in the session, you asked um, with regard to the CVMA position statements, um, should we choose a side or should we talk about, talk about both sides? So this is a really great question. Um, my best advice would be, similar to a CASPER approach, is to initially talk about both sides. Be neutral and recognize that you understand where both parties are coming from, like the pro or the con side, for or against, and recognize why they may feel that way. And then, based on that information, your values, the veterinary profession, and the best interest of the patient or any other general ethical scenario, where do you stand based on the information you do know and information you can find out? Because don't be afraid to be a little skeptical when you get a question or look at a position statement. What information don't you know? Um, don't be afraid to admit that you don't know something and that you can learn more to make the most informed decision possible. And again, extrapolating that to veterinary medicine, you might get a case or a phone call, even as a veterinary receptionist, where you need more information before jumping to conclusions or choosing a side or a final decision. So just kind of taking that realistic approach would be my best advice. Um, so just to summarize, because it was a bit of a long-winded answer, should we choose a side or should we talk about both sides? So I would talk about both sides first and then choose my stance at the very end. Um, Okay, next question. What kind of vet animal experience did you have and for how long? Thank you for your question. This is a good one. Um, keep in mind when I answer questions like these that everyone's path and story is different. So um, take it with a grain of salt, uh, if you will. But I, so I'm currently in my second year of vet school and I started my veterinary volunteer experience in grade 12. So I've been doing 2015. So I had been doing it for at least five to seven years, working at different veterinary clinics and volunteering at different vet clinics before I got into vet school. I primarily worked and volunteered in small animal clinics because that is where my interest lies. But I did have the opportunity to shadow some veterinarians at other volunteer experiences, such as volunteering at a wildlife center and at a dairy cow facility. So I was able to see veterinary professionals working in those settings, but I did have most of my experience in small animal medicine. So it was for a good handful of years, but again, let's say you're applying with one year or one summer under your belt. I know it's especially difficult with the pandemic behind us. Um, just it's important quality, not quantity too. So as long as you can still get valuable um, lessons learned and see what the profession is really like, even in a short amount of time, it, it's still very valuable for your application. Um, next question. What did you find was the most difficult part of the interviews? This is a good question. Um, I can't specifically talk about the interview itself for confidentiality reasons, but I think like the interview process, the hardest part was just, again, it comes back to mindset and stress. It can be really overwhelming. You put a lot of work in school and in your extracurriculars and time outside of these things in order to perfect your application. So when you're practicing and doing those practice sessions and you encounter some setbacks or obstacles you need to overcome within your own skills and in those responses, it can be draining and it can be really difficult to try and stay in that positive mind knowing that a rejection is a possible outcome. But at the same time, knowing that rejection is a possible outcome, I, I went through it and you make it through it and you just try again. So yeah, I think it's just the stress of knowing a rejection is possible. And 
I honestly needed a rejection to show me that the world will keep spinning if I don't get into vet school. So I think it's just kind of learning that vet school isn't everything, no matter how much it means to you and focusing on trying your best in order to perform the best you can. And let's say it doesn't work out. You can look back at your interview prep, knowing you did everything you can, everything you could to make it the best interview you could have had that day. And again, those, if you do reapply or even want to change and go into medicine or anything whatsoever, you're going to have all those interview skills and that life experience under your belt. So it's never for nothing. Um, Just know that the interview process is long and difficult and be compassionate with yourself. So that's where that balance really comes in. Hopefully that answers the question. I'm kind of going on tangents here and there, but um, feel free to feel free to uh, let me know in the chat if you want me to clarify anything. Jordan, uh, will all interviews going forth be virtual or will they return to an in-person setting? Um, I am not sure. I would check the OBC website for that unless anything has officially been edited on the OVC or vet school of interest on their website, I would assume that it's the same as to last year or what is outlined on that page. So um, I'm sure if just keep an eye on that and if they do change it or anything like that, all the other candidates are going, going to know the same time you do. So everyone will be in the same boat. So that might provide a little bit of comfort with respect to that. And let's say you want to cover your base for your virtual and in person, you can then mix up your practice to include both of those styles. And who knows, maybe it will make you feel even more comfortable behind the screen if it does stay virtual. Okay. When paying for a mock interview, next question. When paying for a mock interview, with me or another consultant, where are the questions you are asking coming from? Okay, so for me specifically, I um, I cater questions that helped, that I used in my practice that helped me prepare for my interview. Um, I cannot really use or hint at anything that was in the real interview for confidentiality reasons but I choose questions that I practiced that helped me get to where I needed to be for my interview. Um, And again, all those skills you will learn from any practice that you do can be applied to um, the interview itself. So that's, the questions are catered by myself and uh, future me, I mean, uh, accepted together. I'm sure provides us with resources and such, but um, I kind of like to stem from both personally. Okay, do you know anyone who's a vet tech while in vet school? Would that be a good path? That is such a good question. And I like that because um, again, everyone's path is so different. Some people are in a completely different profession and change to vet last minute and have to get all these prerequisites to get in. And some people like me knew straight out of high school that this is where I wanted to be. So I really like this question. Um, I do, there are a few people in OVC and vet school who um, have already got their vet tech certification. So if the if that was something you wanted to explore, like maybe get your hands on and get that certification first, get some experience in the field and then pursue vet school, by all means, if you think that's a good path for you, go for it. Um, if you know anyone that you've worked with that has taken that path, or you even want to talk to some vets or vet techs to put give their insight, um, that's an, another great approach too, because you'll get to hear real perspectives from people in those roles. Um, So yeah, it's completely up to you, but I don't think it's a bad path by any means. I think it just depends how long you wanna be in school and everything like that. And there's really no rules about that, in my opinion. (laughs) What do you think made you successful the third time around? Did you do anything differently looking back? I like this question. the third time around, well, I'll give you some context here. I didn't want to um, dive too deep into this at the beginning of the interview because I didn't think it was necessary details, but my, so I applied in third year, 
um, I think I applied in third year, fourth year, and then the year after that, after I had got my degree and everything. And the third year, I did not really have the grades to get in. And I knew that, but I wanted to apply anyway to have one biff under my belt that I could work with in future years where I thought I was more a more competitive candidate. And I also wanted my references to be familiar with submitting their reference letters as well. So even though I knew I wasn't really going to get in, I kind of wanted a almost a test run um, through applying, which was discouraged by some people like academic advisors because they felt it was unnecessary to waste one of my attempts. But in, for my mindset, in order to optimize my future applications and really motivate myself to make it happen, that was felt, that's, it's just what felt best to me. And it worked out. Um, the second year, um, I think I just wasn't ready as a candidate. I struggled with confidence and I was really answering questions, what I call the textbook way. I was answering it in a way that I thought the interviewer wanted me to. And it came across, I think even in my practice, it didn't always come across as really genuine. And I didn't really learn that until my third preparation cycle where I was genuinely, genuinely basing my answers off of those foundational brainstormed ideas and my application and personal experiences instead of answering what I thought they wanted to hear. And I think I came across more genuine and I felt more confident in my answers as a result. Um, I don't think I would change anything in hindsight because it all worked out and I think I needed time overall. But something else that was really critical in that third application cycle was that I had more balance. I worked and took more time to relax and pursue my hobbies and meet up with friends and things like that in between all of the preparation. And I think that allowed me to, again, maintain that mindset and take a lot of the pressure off my shoulders. And I knew that I survived after one rejection. So I got nothing to lose. <laughs> All right, so it looks like we have about 10 minutes left. I'll maybe wait a couple more minutes to see if anyone else has questions. Um, we still have most people in the call here. And just for interest sake, um, if anyone's comfortable writing in the chat, like if they applied this year or they're looking to apply, feel free to do so. Um, I hope to see some of you in some sessions if you are, because I'd be really happy to help. Oh, nice. We have one applicant. Congratulations. That's a lot of work. Hopefully I found myself as an applicant when I attended sessions like this. Sometimes it really stressed me out. <laughs> so um, I hope this provided some comfort to, with the stress that comes along with applying. Oh, nice. We have someone that applied as well and applied to Calgary. Interview in 10 days. Good luck. I hope it goes well. And you celebrate after even just the interview itself. Did you try to always fill the interview answer time limit? We have a question from Spencer. This is a great question. Um, hmm. I think... It, First and foremost, it is important to answer the question. Of course, you don't want to go over the time limit, but I would gener generally fill most of the interview answer time. And that was because I would pace out my answers. And because I practiced with a timer, I was comfortable with the duration of my answers. Um, but with that being said, it still answered the question. It was concise. Um, so I felt like it was appropriate for what I wanted to convey in the best way possible. But with that being said, don't feel like if you have, no, you have like set an amount of time left over, you feel like it was short. If you feel adding to it, it's just going to be redundant or anything like that. I would recommend just keeping your answer short or even saying, I'm just going to take a moment to see if I want to add anything to my answer or gather my thoughts so that if you do add to it, it's a benefit and not a detriment. So I think it is dependent on the person, but for myself, I 
usually filled most of the answer limit. And if I had time left over, I was content with leaving it there because I was happy with what I had said. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. I'll probably stay in the call until 7.55 if anyone else has questions. Um, and then I will let everyone continue on with their evening. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm glad the session was helpful. You're welcome. Okay. I was going to wait the full five minutes, but it looks like we have um, uh, everyone kind of heading out. So thank you again, everyone who's still here. And good luck with your application. And I hope to have a session with you soon. Have a good night.